We began a series last week called Abide in Me, which is at the heart of that song, that we want to get closer and closer to him. And to figure out what that means, we're reading a passage of scripture which contains Jesus' final sermon. It was delivered in a room with his closest followers the night before his suffering and his crucifixion. And we're going to spend some time in that this year. We're going to learn what this means to abide in me. There's nothing more important, I think, in this world right now with all of its distractions to have a spiritual center and to be grounded in what God says about who you are. And so we're going to be reading these verses. And they're found, you know, the whole sermon is John chapter 13 through 17. But I, at the beginning of this year, I wanted to take us right to the heart and let you know what this is all about. Let's cut right to the chase and go to the 15th chapter of the book of John, where we hear the words of Jesus saying who we are and what life is about. Now, all of the notes are available to you. If you just want to text the word notes to 68,000, it will give you all the notes. There's hyperlinks in there and some extra stuff that you wouldn't have if you just wrote it. We're making it available to you. If you want to write notes and not look at your phone, then write on, you know, in a notebook or something, and then later go get all of these notes so you have all the scriptures. Let's begin. Let's read these verses from the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John, chapter 1. I am the true vine. This is Jesus speaking. I am the true vine. My Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Let me stop right there and just say not everything that was supposed to be in your life was supposed to be there forever. There are some things that God intends to take away. And every branch in me that does bear fruit, he prunes. That's why you have pain and discouragement, and sometimes God lets, thing in your lets things into your life to prune you for greater fruitfulness, that you may bear more fruit. Now, you're already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you, so you don't have to prove anything, but just abide in me. Get close, remain, stay, stay connected in me, and I'll be in you. As the branch can't bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So watch him repeat this again. Come on, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he's talking about something organic here, bears much fruit. But if you are not connected, you're just a dead branch. Without me, you can do nothing. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. And by this, my Father is glorified that you will bear much fruit. And so you will be my disciples. You'll be like me. Now here's the last phrase and he says it again. As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you Abide in my love. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus is going to repeat himself and say these words over and over again. Nine specific times he talks about, I have loved you. I still love you. The Father loves you. You're the beloved child of God. And he keeps repeating it because he knows that it's hard for the disciples to, to grasp. They're highly anxious. They're about to... No, they know something is going on and Jesus is talking about going to his father and leaving them and they're, they're filled with anxiety. And Jesus is saying, stay close to me. Even if I go away, I'll come back, but remain in me, stay in me, trust me, stay connected to me. Stay connected to this word that I love you. Believe it, claim it, abide in my love and it was hard for them to do, and it's hard for you to do. There is a voice that's inside of you, a little self-rejecting voice, that does not want to believe that this is true. So as much as I've been saying this to you for about three minutes now, there's a part of you saying, well, I know that might be true for some people, but that's probably not true for me because I'm not one of those super Christians. I'm not super devoted. Like, I'm not up to here. Like, I don't have time just to sit at home all day and pray all day. Like, I have a real job. I go to work. And I live in the real world. And so I'm not, I mean, I'm close to, I, I want God, but I, I, I can't do it. And then you look at your life and you might say, well, you know, if you only knew me, pastor, you know what I did, what I've done. You, my heart's not as close to God as it should be. I do things that aren't good and I, I can't stop. And I want to, I want to be a good person, but I'm frustrated because I don't measure up. And so most of you believe that God's probably upset with you. And I want you to hear this, not here, but hear it somewhere in here today that 
that Jesus is speaking this word to you. You are the beloved daughter of God. You are the beloved son of God. Nothing will change that. That is what God is speaking over you. And yet you will obsess your whole life trying to find out, is that really true? Now, I have a historical mentor. His name is Henry Nowen. I say historical mentor because he's no longer living, so he mentors me through his books and his teaching and the writings and all the things he's left behind. But Henry Nowen was a devoted, beautiful human being, a Catholic priest, a brilliant psychologist. He taught at Notre Dame, he taught at Harvard, he taught at Yale, but he spent most of his life actually among the poor. And in the last years of his life, he spent his life in a community of people just outside Toronto, Canada, and the people, most of whom were unable to speak, unable to do for themselves. They were people that had exceptional needs. Many of them couldn't walk or even survive without the assistance of others for every aspect of their life. And he chose to remain among uh, what we would classify as the poor and the broken, and he became a pastor to this little community. And he's a beautiful, humble man whose writings speak to us today. And one of the things he says in his book, Life of the Beloved, and in his teaching uh, series, Being the Beloved, he says that we obsess our whole lives over this question, who am I? And it's a question I ask you today, who are you? Or who would you say that you are? Who am I? And we'll spend our whole lives trying to figure that out. And the problem is our lives are very short. Like this is my whole life right here, okay? I was born in 1970. Not long ago uh, to me, and some of you think, oh my gosh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> but it was 1970, it's the 70s. Um, I, did not, I was not raised in this country, I was raised outside of it, so I kind of have a black hole. Uh, if I went on Jeopardy and you asked me about the 70s, I would lose because I was outside of the country. But if it was in an encyclopedia, I can answer that question because I read all the encyclopedias. You know, I was a nerdy little kid growing up overseas with no television. All right, but I started off in 1970, and if I live my whole life, I might end up to 2065. I mean, 95 years old, not bad. Maybe I'll live to 2070. Maybe I get 100 years, maybe a few years more, maybe a few years less. I don't know, but, but what's crazy is there's my whole life. In the expanse of all time and all the history of the world and all the people who have ever lived, I get, this is all I get. I have this little Life And my point I'm making is it's very short. And some of you say, well, Darren, I was born later than you, so I get more years. No, you get your years just like me. You just, where, I don't know where our lives overlap, but your life, my point is, is it's over like this. It's a blink of an eye. It's short. And some of you might say, well, I'm kind of mad at God because someone I love didn't live like the life they should have. Listen, it doesn't matter how many years you live in the scope of history the life we live, however short or long, it's, it's just short for everybody. It's short. And in this very short life, you and I will obsess the whole time over who am I? And the world has three answers to give you, now and says, that we take on and we live our lives through the lens of these three things. So the world says that you are what you do. So you accomplish and you work hard and you try to gain an identity through what you do. And so if things are going well and you accomplish a lot and you do a lot of good things, um, you feel good about yourself. But if you can't do what you once did or you, or you make a mistake or you do something wrong or you fail or you don't achieve what you'd hope to achieve, the business didn't work out, the thing that you went after, you didn't, you didn't grab it, you didn't win, we start to feel very low. And now one says, actually, the older that we get, the more we obsess about, you know, when we can't do what we used to do, we talk about what we did. So we start talking about our trophies. We talk about our books that we wrote and the children we raised and the legacies that we've left and the money that we gave. And we're, look at the good. Look, 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 look at all the good things that I did. As if life is all about what we do. But that's one of the things that we live our lives for. You are what you do. That's it. And if you do well... Good, but if you do poorly, you don't feel very good. And then the world says, you are what other people say. So when people are saying good things about you, and this is so powerful, by the way, the words spoken over to us probably mean more than almost anything else. And when people are saying good things, they're 
cheering us or praising us or liking us, saying good things about us, then we feel great. We feel like we're on top of the world. But let them speak behind your back. Let somebody cut you down. Let someone be critical of you or speak poorly of you or embarrass you. Post something on social media that brings you uh, in a negative light or embarrasses you and your whole world falls apart when we, we hate it. You know, a, a hundred people could say, you're wonderful. And then that one person comes up and says something critical. That was nonsense. I didn't like it. And my whole world is upside down. Because that one thing that somebody said, especially if that person is someone that you look up to or is close to you. The problem is, is that the people in our lives that were supposed to speak well of us oftentimes didn't do that. So our fathers and our mothers and the people that we wanted to have their approval and they didn't give it to us as they should have. And so we're living our whole lives. How many people are living their lives trying to prove something because someone didn't say what they should have said? Well, I'll show you. I met a man last Sunday right after this service. I walked out into the lobby and this really put together gentleman, a um, little bit younger than me, but you, he could have stepped off the cover of a fashion magazine, so put together, had a beautiful wife, children, teenagers. I mean, the put together family. Like you would say, this is, the, this is what everybody in this community would hope to achieve or look like. And he told me this story. The message had so impacted him because his eyes were full of tears. He said, my father, who's an alcoholic, and you know, I, I, I don't have to tell you, if you know, you know. Said words that were so targeted and so painful over me, told me what a terrible son I was over the Christmas break, that he was telling me this incredible story as he had tears in his eyes of having his father say things to him about what a horrible son he was. And it, it shot his blood pressure up and his anxiety so high, he ended up in the emergency room on Christmas Eve. That's where he spent Christmas Eve. Because the words of someone who's close to us, when they say you're stupid, or they say you're ugly, or you're not enough, or you disgust me, those are so destructive. And we take those words in and they define who we are. A lot of people are being defined by what others say. So you are what you do and you are what others say. And then this world, and I think this is the one we really struggle with in this community, is you are what you have. You're as good as what you have. So I have a, a big house in the right neighborhood and I drive the right car and I have the clothes and I have the things and the toys and all the stuff that this world says I should have. I feel good about myself. But if I don't have, the car I just bought isn't as nice as what the neighbor, I don't have, so I'm not as happy. Or if you don't have what you used to have, then you feel a little low. So if you have something that makes you happy, but then you, you don't have. Or, or you, you have a lot of followers, a lot of people obsessing about how many people liked me on social media, or how many followers do I have. And if you have a lot, then you're great. But if you can't get anybody to notice, you don't have, then you feel low. If, if you have a lot of status, you've, you've somehow made it into the membership of the group and they, they hold you up, then I have this position, I have the job, I have, a, I have my health. And it's a good health, so I feel good about myself. I have, I'm part of a good family. I have good parents. I have good children. I have a, a, a place. Then we feel good about ourselves. But, but what happens when you lose what you had? I lost the loved one. I lost my husband. I lost my wife. I lost uh, my, my parents. I've lost my health. I can't, I can't, I don't have what I used to have. I don't, I, I somehow made a mistake and I lost the position. I lost the job. I lost what I had. And suddenly you're in the lowest of lows. So now it says you have this definition of our life, what you do, what you say, and if things go well and you have and you achieve and people are saying good things, we're, we're flying, we're good. But if we don't have and we we look at others and we see that they have a life that we, we can't possibly compete with or we look at ourselves and we look at their standard. I don't have those looks. I don't have, you know, the biceps or the abs or, you know, I could go further. I'll stop right there. You know, you just say, that's not what I have. So you, you, think, you think less of yourself. 
And what ends up happening is we end up living these lives of a zigzag, like from highs to lows, highs to lows. We're just hoping that somehow we can just stay above like the baseline. Like if I could just stay just enough above it, we call it surviving. We're just, we're just living in survival. Like I hope I can just feel good enough about me today because I know what the lows feel like and we call it just surviving. That, that's, a, that's a terrible way to live, but it's all the world offers us. And the problem now and says is what happens when you get old and you get to the end and you start to face death or you die? Because everybody's gonna die, everybody will come to a point and then you can't do anymore. Like, I'm dead. I mean, dead is dead, you can't do anymore and no one's gonna talk about you anymore. And um, you don't have anything because when you die, you can't take anything physical with you. And so it goes to somebody else. And so the question is, if that's the construct of your life, if that's what you think life is all about, now one says you're gonna be very depressed. In fact, some of you will get bitter and you will say, God, it wasn't fair, I didn't get, I didn't have, they didn't say, and you'll be upset. And you'll look at a person who comes to the end of their life and you'll say things, well, was it all for nothing? Was it a waste? Did they not, they didn't get what they were deserved and, and people's lives lives fall apart and the reason why is because it's wrong. It's not true. It's a total lie. Everything about that kind of thinking that, that you only are what you do or what other people say or what you have, it's not true. It's actually rooted in a lie that Jesus heard. When Jesus was in the desert and the devil himself came to him, do you know what he said to him? He says, if you're the son of God, like if you are all that, then prove it. Do something. Turn these stones to bread. You gotta do something to show me who you are. And then he took Jesus to the top of the temple and he put him up on the pinnacle and he says, Jesus, why don't you throw yourself down if you're the son of God, prove it. And then the angel, let the angel, like God's promise, let the angel come and catch you. So do something spectacular that will just amaze people. Like, wow, look at him. He was caught by an angel, wow. People will talk about you if that happens. And then he said, why don't you just kneel and bow to me and then I will, I'll give it all to you, you'll have it all. And when you do something and when, you, when, when people are saying They're, you're amazing and they see how spectacular you are and when you have it all, then people will love you and then people will appreciate you and then, then you'll be somebody. And Jesus looked those lies in the face and says, whoa, devil, uh, no, you will not tempt me I know who I am. I am the beloved son of my father. I am the beloved son of God and he is well pleased with me. Jesus was led by that same spirit that led him out into the desert to be tempted, also led him to a baptism where, the, where when he went down under that water and he was coming up out of that water, the spirit of God descended upon him and the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son, you are my beloved I love you, I'm so proud of you, you are my son, and you, my favor rests. And Jesus lived his life from that place, so they praised him and they insulted him. They shouted Hosanna and they shouted crucify him and Jesus didn't waver back and forth or zig or zag, he lived his whole life. It doesn't matter what you say about me, good or bad, I know who I am. It doesn't matter what you do or what you don't do. You can follow me or you can not follow me. I, doesn't, I know who I am. So that's how he did it. That's how they could, that's how he endured the successes and the praises and the laughing and the spitting and all of that, he could endure it because he knew who he was. That's what he was trying to communicate to his followers. If you're gonna follow me, you can expect that you're gonna have some of the same things happen to you, that life is gonna pull you and you've gotta know who you are. Abide in the truth. And that's what I want you to hear in your soul today, that you are not what you have and you're not what people say and you're not what you do. You are the beloved daughter of God. You're the beloved son of God. And I, I wish I could take time. It's so powerful when words are spoken over you. I did it last week. And when, when somebody looks at you and says, you're the beloved daughter of God, and nothing will ever change that. Like no matter what you do, what anybody says about you, your whole life, hold on to this, that you're the beloved daughter of God. And you too, you're the beloved daughter of God. Beautiful. It doesn't matter if it's been hard or difficult, God loves you that way. 
And you're the beloved son of God. Not, not what you've done or what you did or what you've accomplished or what you have. You are the beloved son of God. I wish I could tell each one of you, you need to hear this in your soul. Your children need to hear this and you need to hear this. I don't care how old you are or how young you are. But God knows that you need to have your identity rooted in the truth. And this world that we live in pulls us in every other direction and it will lead you to ultimate frustration and pain. You need to know that God has inscribed you on the palm of his hands like before you were even born. Like while you were in the womb, he saw you and he formed you and he made you and he loves you. Like from an everlasting place, like before time began, he knew your name and he saw you. And you think you chose God? No, that's not what it says. Sherry, God chose you. And so you're not an accident. Like you're not, you're not a mistake. And he chose you and he made you and you are his daughter and he is, you're the beloved daughter of God and you've always been that no matter what anybody else has ever said about you. I love you too. Every one of you have a story, and, and the stories of rejection are everywhere. They're all here. And we have the self-rejecting voice that tells us, oh, I don't know if that's true. So, so Jesus tells his disciples, I know this is going to be hard for you to hold on to, because you can't just hear words, you know, because these words are great for right now, but what about three o'clock in the morning when the devil comes for you and tries to say, you're not all that, and you know what those people said, and you, were, you don't have nothing. So he will come for you, um, but you need to put this down somewhere and start to say this. That's why we're doing the 21 days of prayer. We're getting close to God for a period of time where we're saying, God, we're going to get close to you and we're going to believe what you say about us. And I want you to, to know this word abide means to like to stay, to, to, to remain, to be connected to, to, to do what you have to do to just get close. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to prove anything to God, but just get close to him and listen to him. Like, listen to him, really listen to him. And then turn down some of the feeds of the world that you've been listening to that, that make you buy into all that chaos and turn it off. And then just for a little bit of time, just go, this is who I really am. What if, what if you could do that for a year? Like, one year of your life, you could unhook from the way of the world and you just went all in. I am who God says that I am. I think that your life has a trajectory right now and it's being defined by whatever the inputs are that you're saying, this is who I am. I think it's leading you in a direction. And I think that Jesus has a direction for you to go, which is I am, I, you are loved. You have nothing to prove, follow me. And if you would just listen to that voice, you wouldn't recognize yourself a year from now. And I've seen it. And one of the things that Jesus does for his disciples in this sermon is he keeps giving them these tangible examples of his love. He washes their feet. We'll talk about that. He does things for them and he explains things for them. And like he takes a glass of, of wine off the, a cup of wine and he takes bread. We talked about the experience that he gave them of Holy Communion, we call it now, or the Eucharist or whatever you call it. But he takes, he takes this bread and this cup and he says, this is an experience. This is something you can taste, you can hold on to, you can touch. It's tangible, it's substantial, it's real. And I want you to remember that in this is your identity. Jesus uh, took bread, he broke it, he blessed it, or he blessed it and he broke it and he said, I'm given, I'm giving this to you. And that's what Jesus, that was his identity. I was taken and I was blessed by God and I was broken on a cross and I was given for you. And he says, that's your identity. When you hold that in your hands, you recognize that you were chosen by God. You've been blessed by God since before you were born. You're broken because you live in this world, but God wants to give you to the world. And so we, we hold in our hands something that reminds us of our identity, which is why it's not just a churchy thing churches do. This is a, a practice that you can say, this is who I am, and this is who Jesus is. And we have an experience. 
And in that experience, we're changed. In fact, the, the first two disciples who came across Jesus after his resurrection, they, they, saw, they didn't even recognize him until he picked up the bread and the cup. And then their hearts began to burn within them and they went, oh, it's the Lord. And that's what happens when you have an experience that helps you remember, I know who I am. So communion is one experience, but he gives, there's another experience he wants you to have that he actually commanded. He says, I want all my followers to have this. And it's the same one that he had, which is water baptism. Water baptism is an identification with Jesus. It's, it's not a thing that churches do. It's not a church ritual. It's an experience Jesus said, I want you to have I had this experience and I want you to have it. So Jesus doesn't have to be baptized. He shows up to John the Baptist and John goes, whoa, you're the son of God, like you should be baptizing me. And he goes, no, 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 I'm gonna do this to fulfill all the right things. I want, th I want this is what's proper and what's right. And Jesus goes down and he is immersed. He is, that's what baptism means. He's immersed under the water. And as he goes up, as he comes up out of the water, he is he is filled with the Spirit of God and the voice of his Father speaks over him. You're my beloved son. And so Jesus lived his life from that experience and he says, I want you to have that experience. What's that experience? Well, it's, it's a moment where I follow Jesus physically. There's a date on the calendar. It happened, it's real. I faced the, the little death that has to happen to stand up in front of people and say, you know what, I've decided to follow Jesus. I've been living this way, like this way of the world, which is all about what I have and what I do and what people say about me, but I'm laying that down and I'm gonna live out of my real identity that, that I am the beloved son or daughter of God. And so there's something inside of you that literally dies as you wrestle through. Am I gonna do that? Yeah, stand up in the presence of the other believers who have done the same thing, who have identified with Jesus, and you have that experience of, uh, of a death going under the water and then being raised up to new life, and you come out of that water and you know. So when the devil comes at you and says, well, you're not all of that, you're, you're nothing, you're, you're not, you're, look what you did, look at that mistake, you're a sinner, you're, you're messed up, or people are saying horrible things about you, you don't have nothing, and you'll say, what are you talking about? I, I stood up. I declared before the church and everybody and all the community that I'm a child of God. I know who I am. Be gone, Satan. Like, leave me alone. I remember when I made that decision. I, had, I, had, I was a teenager, and I, I was trembling about it, but I knew I had to do it. So I, I got up. It was my decision, and I got into that water. And I was under the water, so I didn't hear a voice or anything, but guess what? It, it happens. It's like what happened to Jesus. Like, the Holy Spirit is present, and he lets you know. Like, on the inside, I had this. It's almost like I could just, I had it. Like, you are the beloved son of God. In you, I am well pleased. I've never gotten over that experience. So I want to ask you, have you had that experience? Now, some would say, well, no, I've never had that experience before. Well, you'll never have all that God has for you if you don't follow him and abide in him and, and take advantage of the experience. This is what he means when he says, abide in me, get close to me. Do everything I tell you to do. Like, just follow me, get close, and I'll do the work inside of you. And some of you are say, well, I was baptized as a baby. Well, that's great, that's good, I mean, but it's not this. This is different than that. That's your parents baptizing you into the church which is important, and we, we believe in that, but this is an experience where you remember. You don't remember being a baby when they did all that. That was their experience, but this is an experience you need to have where you sit there and you wrestle with, am I going to bless you? <laughs> in Jesus' name. <laughs> and that is, that is an experience that you need to have where you kind of go through that little death and burial and uh, resurrection experience for yourself. And if you've never had that experience, I want you to have it so that it's another way. Like, you don't have to do it for me. You don't have to do it for the church. It's not some membership requirement. You need it. Because you just try to, your little self-rejecting voice and the rejections that have happened all through your life are more powerful than just you alone. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So if you will just immerse yourself in the love of God, then guess what? You're, you're doing your part to take advantage of what God has for you which is your real identity. And I want you to listen to it and claim it and believe in it and trust it and 
secure it for yourself. Look at this verse. I have been crucified with Christ. So that's me. I've decided, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm dying to me, that way of thinking. I am what I have, I am what people say, I am what I do, gone. I'm gonna live, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God, what he said. Who, watch this, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the love of God for you. It's an all-in kind of love. That's an all-in verse, everybody. God loved you so much, he gave his son. Greater love has no one than this, than he would lay down his life for you. So all he's asking is, well, go all in with me. I went all in for you, you go all in with me, and let's see where that goes. I guarantee you, you go all in with God for one year, you will not recognize yourself because your identity has changed. You'll be living your life, listen, uh, not by what people say about you, but what God says about you. Like your identity will be this, I am the beloved son or daughter of God. My identity is not as one who is trying to figure out who I am. I know who I am, okay? So the next baptism on our calendar is two weeks from now, Baptism Sunday, January 28th, two weeks. And you can be a part of that. If you want to know more about it, text BAPTISM. If you want to register for it, text BAPTISM, 68,000. It's an opportunity for you to say, I have decided for me to identify with Christ. Now, I'll close it this way. The problem that we're trying to address here is that no other love can fully satisfy our souls. And we've searched for it in all the wrong places or even the right places, but there's no person that can give you everything that your heart needs. Your heart was made by God in such a way that God is the only one that can fill it because he's the one who loved you first. Say that with me. He loved me first. That's what the Bible says. We love, we're, we're, we have the capacity to love now because he loved us first. Listen, that means he loved you before your mom. He loved you before your dad. He loved you before your brothers and sisters. He loved you before your teachers. He loved you before um, your, your friends and, and, and everybody. He loved you first. And what the heart of God is, I'm trying to call you back to that first love who loved you before that little timeline, before that even started. He loved you before all that. And yet we have the self-rejecting voice and we have the stories of rejection because the people who were supposed to love us didn't love us like they should have. So our mom didn't do that as we should have. As, you know, it wasn't all that I needed, right? Or our dad didn't love you. Your dad didn't love you like he should have. Or your brothers and sisters, somebody that was close to you, that you trusted they did something to you or hurt you or abused you. Maybe it was a teacher that didn't love you like they should have. Or a pastor or your church, or somewhere along the way, people who were supposed to care for you and, and love you, they did not do what they should. And I want you to claim this first love because before they messed up, there was a love that held you. You didn't know it, but God has always loved you. He's always loved you. And if you just get close, if you abide in that love, your first love, what, what if you could grab hold of that? Out of that relationship, out of that love that you re reconnect to, you would find that you will begin to have the capacity to forgive those who hurt you. You will be able to love as you should and you will become more free because there's a lot of people who are living their whole lives because somebody said something or did something in yesterday and they're in prison, they're still enslaved by it. God wants you free from that. So this is the year for that to happen. If you were to abide in him, like go all in, say, Lord, this year, I want to get as close to you as I can. I think that God will begin to rewrite and heal and restore some of the things from yesterday. Grab hold of this first love and recognize and just admit it. Those other people, they could never, like their love is only partial. The love of your parents could only ever be partial. The love of a spouse can only ever be partial. It'll be painful. It's not going to meet all your needs. But God, who made you and wants to fulfill you, 
He has spoken over you that you are his beloved son or daughter. And I invite you to live in that. So we're going to take now this cup and this piece of bread. We're going to have this experience now of what Christ has done for us. And in your hands, you have the tangible proof that says to you this, you have nothing to prove. You have nothing to prove. You belong to him. He loved you first. And I want you to contemplate that love and let that sink into your soul. John will come and sing, and then we're going to take and eat this together. There's a hunger and a thirst. I am desperate, so immerse me. I'm not waiting anymore, because I need There's a hunger and a thirst. I am desperate. Immerse me, Lord. I'm not waiting anymore. Cause I need you, Lord. Yes, I need you. Lord, we hold in our hands your love expressed, your body broken, your blood poured out. You, the Lamb of God, who were taken, blessed of God, broken on a cross, given to us. And so today, Lord, we hold this in our hands. We receive this. This is our identity. This is who we are. We are chosen and we are broken but we are still loved by God. That blessing sits over our brokenness today. And you wanna give us to the world. So today, Lord, we come back to you. And I wanna lead you in a prayer. If you feel far from God or you've believed the lie that God's angry with you or you feel distant from him, come close. Pray this prayer with me. Anybody can pray it. It goes like this. God, I need you. I need you. I am so sorry for acting like I didn't and for living without you. Will you forgive me? Thank you, God. Now, Lord, I give you my life. I go all in. I surrender. You can have me. You can lead me. I'm yours. Make me like you. Jesus, you are the vine. We're just the branches. We connect ourselves to you. Let your life flow into us today. Let your healing flow into us today. Let your forgiveness flow into our lives today. We eat this bread. We remember what you went through and the cost of the gift of life. Let's eat this bread together. Thank you for your life and for this cup, the blood that was shed for us, for our healing. 
And Lord, there are people in this room today and just even talking about this brings up places in their life of great pain and brokenness, words that were said. And I pray that you would cancel whatever is a lie, you shine the light on it and it would shrivel up and it has no power over us anymore in Jesus' name. We believe who we are. We believe that we are your sons and daughters. We believe that you have a purpose for our life, a design for our life. You've given life as a gift to us to give to others. And we receive it and we drink it in today in Jesus' name. no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen and amen. Do you guys believe that today? Amen. This is our faith. I pray that you leave here today filled with the love of God. And I pray that you would live out this identity. And I pray that God would allow you to love others from this place of security. That's my blessing. Now we'll be back tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. for the day eight or day nine of the 21 days of prayer. And I hope you come back out, but I love you so much. I'll see you outside in the lobby in just a moment. Thanks for coming. God bless you. Keep coming back.